It's TV school time. WOI TV, in association with Iowa State Teachers College, presents another program in the Iowa TV School Time series Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic Lewis. Your teacher is Herb Haig of Iowa State Teachers College and guest, Carol Penninger. I'm on my way to Canada, that cold and dreary land. The dire effect of slavery I can no longer stand. My soul is vexed within me so to think I am a slave. I'm now resolved to strike the blow for freedom or the grave. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. I'm going north to Canada. I'm going to be free. Scared all the chickens out of the feedlot. Hello, boys and girls. How'd you like that song? The chickens here didn't care for it very much. Dr. Pendergraft has to stay because he's on the program. But a long time ago, over a hundred years ago, this song was probably sung in the cellar of this house. This is a station on the Underground Railroad, one of the oldest buildings used for that purpose in the state of Iowa. It was a parsonage at one time, but its historical interest rests upon the fact that it was a station on the Underground Railroad. And here at one time, the slaves sang this song about escaping to Canada. And this was also the place where John Brown, Osawatomie Brown of bloody Kansas, hid from the officers of the law. I'm sure you've seen pictures of this kind of John Brown, a fiery type of rebel, looked very much like the Old Testament prophets. He believed in freedom for the slaves. And he was personally responsible for taking a lot of slaves across Iowa to freedom. And at one time, he hid in the basement of this house, in the cellar, in a secret room down there, so the sheriff and other officers of the law couldn't find him. This is near Lewis, Iowa. Let me show you on the map of Iowa where Lewis is located. Lewis is over here, not far from the East Nishnabotna River. This is the Nishnabotna. Some of the people in this part of the state call this the Nishnabotna. But the spelling is Nishnabotna. N-I-S-H-N-A-B-O-T-N-A. -N -A -N -A. Nishnabotna. This is the West Nishnabotna. But right here, this white dot is Lewis. And about a mile west of town is this old slave house, this station on the Underground Railroad. And I'd like to ask Dr. Pendergraft to tell you about that. I'm very glad to have Dr. Pendergraft with me today, not only because he's a good friend of mine, but also because he's my boss. Dr. Pendergraft is Director of Field Services at the Iowa State Teachers College, and radio and TV are a part of field services. So I have to be extra careful today that I say the right thing because he is not only my boss, he is also an authority on American history and the history of the West in particular. And he can tell you this story of the Underground Railroad much better than I can. So Dr. Pendergraft, would you tell the boys and girls about the Underground Railroad? I'd be glad to, Herb. Of course, the Underground Railroad, what it really means is that the Slaves followed this method, a secret route to escape from slavery to freedom. It has nothing to do, of course, with a road or a railroad running underground. As long as uh, we have any recorded history, one man has tried to enslave another man. And as long as that's happened, we've had many, many slaves seeking freedom. Sometimes it's because they were being cruelly treated, overworked, but basically because they wanted to be free. 
And as long as that's uh, taken place, we've also had the uh, other people who tried to aid these people, to these slaves, to escape their freedom. We've always had a group of people who did not uh, feel that the law, which said that a, a slave should be returned to slavery, was a good law, that there was a higher law, God's law, that said a man had a right to be free, and therefore he was willing to break this first law. Now the, the title of Underground Railroad actually came from a place in uh, Ohio, Finley, Ohio, where a group of slaves were being pursued by their master across the Ohio River. And as soon as they landed in Ohio, they seemed to just disappear into the ground. And this uh, old slave owner said, it appears that they have taken an underground road. At this particular time, of course, the railroads were astonishing everyone with their speed. And so it wasn't any time at all until it was said that uh, Underground Railroad was the method by which the slaves escaped to freedom. Now these uh, slaves followed various routes across uh, Iowa. Of course, uh, Iowa became a state here uh, in the 1840s, 1846, and so the first routes were in the settled part of Iowa through here. Farmington, and Salem, and there's Denmark down through here, all of which were very famous places uh, stations, as you call them, on the Underground Railroad through eastern Iowa. Mont Pleasant, Crawfordsville, Columbus Junction, Muscatine, and so on. Then there are other routes which aren't shown on the map here at all. Towns aren't even mentioned. Bloomfield and Centerville coming up through here from Missouri. You see, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of routes for slaves to escape. Clear from the Atlantic Ocean, clear all over into Nebraska. They weren't merely trying to get into the northern states. They were trying to get through the northern states into Canada, which was free country. Because as long as they were in any part of the United States, they might be returned back into slavery again. In fact, the federal marshals and the court authorities, the sheriffs and so on, were required to help capture the slaves and to return them to their masters. Now, the, the most famous of all these underground roads through uh, Iowa was the one that you referred to with a station here at Lewis. And this is sometimes called the John Brown route across Iowa. You'll note that it came across the Missouri River here at Percival and then on up to Tabor, which is also a very famous underground station. Then across here to Macedonia, to Lewis, to Anita, Stewart, Des Moines, Newton, Grinnell, Marengo, Iowa City, and on across to Clinton or to Davenport and Muscadine and so on. Now, you must remember that this is not a road, a well-beaten path, because even though it's shown like this on the map, there were literally dozens of ways that when one particular station became uh, rather too obviously a station on the underground and the local sheriff had his eye on the place, they would take off some other way. Instead of going from Lewis to Anita, for example, they might strike down Lewis and go across this way and hit the underground later on. They're all heading towards the eastern part of Iowa to Chicago and the Great Lakes where they would take a ship into Canada. This is a very significant part of our history. The southern slave owners resented very much the whole underground railroad method of helping the slaves escape. You see, we had a federal law at this time, the Fugitive Slave Law, which said that masters had a right to capture their, uh, their escaped slaves and that when this happened, the sheriffs and all the law officers were supposed to help. And there was quite a heavy fine and imprisonment for people that helped the uh, slavery. Now you have the northern people then, many, many hundreds of them, helping these slaves. So they were guilty of breaking the federal law. And uh, the southerners resented this very keenly. They said the whole constitution and the whole body of federal laws is a compact, a contract between all the people of the whole country. And when one party to the contract is deliberately breaking the, the contract, as they were doing with the Fugitive Slave Law, then the other party to the contract has a perfect right to pull up stakes, to pull out of the Constitution, to pull away from the rest of the states so they can keep their slaves unprotected. So the Underground Railroad, you see, has a very great significance. It's one of the main reasons why the South was so bitter towards the North and why they were interested in seceding from the, the, the Union 
and which, of course, brought on the Civil War. Uh, Dr. Pendergraft, we refer to these places as stations on the Underground Railroad. I'll, I've also seen reference to conductors on the Underground Railroad. I suppose those were the people who helped the slaves to escape. Yes, they developed a whole uh, vocabulary of names, taking their names from the railroad, which was so popular in those days. The conductors, of course, were the individuals who took them from one station to another. Yes. And you also had the engineers and other people that they gave them the titles for. The station master, of course, would be the person who secrets them while at a particular station. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pendergraft. I'd like to show you, boys and girls, some books that are interesting in connection with the story of the Underground Railroad. Here is one about Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was a Negro slave who helped 300 of the people of her race to escape from slavery. This is a very interesting story, and it's based upon historical fact, the story of Harriet Tubman. It's a book written by Anne Patry. And here is another one, Escape by Night. Now, you notice the cover picture there. Night was the best time to transfer these slaves from one station to another because the law enforcement officers were not likely to be quite so vigilant at that time. And if the night was stormy, that made it all the more successful to transport the slaves from one place to another. So here you see a wagon which is carrying these slaves from one station to another. This has some interesting pictures in it. Here is one here that shows the, the, one of the conductors taking some of the slaves across country from one station to another. Here is another one that shows how the slaves were sometimes disguised. They were veiled. And there is a, there is a sheriff standing by watching these women just walk right by under his nose. And he doesn't realize that these are escaped slaves. They're dressed like white folks and the veils over their faces conceal the fact that their skins are black. I'm sure your teacher must have a copy of this Iowan magazine for July 1956. It's the one that has this picture of the beautiful church with the white spire on the cover. This has a very fine article in it about the Underground Railroad in Iowa and shows many places on the map of Iowa which were not indicated on this map that Dr. Pendergraft showed you a moment ago. A very fine article about the Underground Railroad in this particular issue of the Iowa magazine. So you look that up and read the story about the Underground. Now, last summer, when I was making arrangements for our visit today, I took some movies of the area around this old slave house and I'd like to have you see this film so that you get some idea of how well it was located for this particular purpose. You see, it was not in town. Very few of these stations on the Underground Railroad were in the heavily settled parts of the state. That is, usually the stations were out on the edge of town somewhere so that the neighbors couldn't see what was going on. And this particular house was located on a hill where people could look around and see people coming and it was very well located for that purpose. The film is in Ames, and I'd like to have Mr. Bork show it to you now so that we can all look at it together. If you're ready, Mr. Bork, let's look at it. Here we go. Here is a view toward the west, which shows the, the countryside, the rolling hills, and the many places of concealment that the slaves might use on their way to the house which is coming into the picture here at the left. There is the house, you see. Now this was on a hill, and there were valleys on both sides of it. Looking east, you see the valley of the East Nishnabotna River, winding along, and Lewis is on the far side of this stream. Even today, this house is remote from other houses in the neighborhood because there are no other locations suitable for it. Here is the Nishnabotna River. You see, it's just a, just a creek, really, not a big 
roaring stream like the Mississippi or the Missouri, but it's called a river. A bridge crossing the stream here now. At the time this house was used as a station on the Underground Railroad, there was no bridge. There was just a ferry. And when the water was low, of course, they could go across without taking a boat. But when the water was high, they had to use a ferry, and that sometimes caused some complications in, in getting the slaves across the stream. Here are some views in the village of Lewis itself, about a mile from the old slave house. A very quiet little town. The business district is about two blocks long. And there is the Lewis drugstore where you can buy a copy of a book that I'll show you in a minute that tells the story of the old slave house. We have made a complete trip through the business district here. But some very friendly people living here now, just as there were over a hundred years ago when the slaves needed friends. Not much traffic on the street, you see. That dog there isn't a bit disturbed by walking across the street very, very slowly. Well, here is that book that I wanted to show you. The Land and the Men, Now and Then. And inside, there is a story of the old slave house. You see the picture there at the top of the page? There are two or three pages here about this old slave house. And you can order this book and get a copy of it for one dollar by writing to the Lewis Drugstore, Lewis, Iowa. That's a bargain. I'm not giving a commercial for this book, you understand, but I mean this is a book which you can only get in that one place. Now let me show you some pictures of some of the landmarks in this area. First of all, I'd like to show you a picture of the slave house that we're visiting. And I thought perhaps we ought to take a, a closer look at this in order to show the crack in the wall that has developed here. This is made of stone, this old house. And the walls are very thick. But after all, it is over a hundred years old and a crack has formed in here and this is this has all been filled with cement it's still a good strong house but it is interesting because this was a station on the underground railroad probably the most famous station in iowa now remember boys and girls this is a private dwelling now it is occupied by mr and mrs alan miller and if you go to lewis and want to find this old slave house, ask someone to tell you how to get to the Allen Miller place. But when you get out there, don't just walk in. How would you feel if somebody just walked into your house in order to look around? We must respect the privacy of people who live in a house. But Mr. and Mrs. Miller are always very kind and accommodating if you take the trouble to knock and ask whether you might see the basement, which was a shelter for the passengers on the Underground Railroad, and they'll be very glad to have you come in. Here is a view of the basement and the fireplace, and the slaves were able to prepare their meals here. And this was also the first altar for a church in the Lewis area. The house itself was built by Reverend George B. Hitchcock, who was the minister in the Lewis area. And he believed in helping the slaves escape. He didn't support the idea that any man could be owned by another man. And he believed, as Dr. Pendergraft said, that there is a higher law, the law of God, which says that all men are equal. So many times services were conducted here in front of this fireplace. And John Brown stood in front of this fireplace many times when he came through this part of the country, talking to the people who were his charges and whom he was conducting to freedom. This is the outside entrance, you see. And there was a secret room in this cellar, which looked just like a part of the wall where the slaves could be hidden in case the sheriff got on their trail. Here is a house near the river. This is the old ferry house. The people who operated the ferry lived here. 
And this was a favorite place for the sheriff and the law, law enforcement officers to watch for people who might be coming from the old slave house. There is no record that they ever caught anybody, but at least they kept watching. Here is the first courthouse in the county. It now is a private dwelling. Another interesting landmark in Lewis, near the city park. And in the park itself, there is this Mormon trail marker. The Mormon trail also came through this part of the country. And I think that's very interesting that the route of the Underground Railroad and the earlier Mormon trail of 1846 came through this same general area. And that's, a, that's an interesting uh, coincidence. And I'd like to ask you about that, Dr. Pendergraft. Is it true that uh, once a trail like this was established, for example, the Mormon Trail, that John Brown saw that this was the logical trail to use for the Underground Railroad? Well, actually, of course, they're both going in this uh, direction east and west. The Mormons are going west. The, yes. The slaves are going to the east, and they would follow the route, which would be most advantageous. And, of course, you must remember that when the Mormons went west, uh, they did tend to uh, build uh, uh, houses and cabins, and they tried to find the best fords of streams and so on. Mm -hmm. So there were uh, good reasons why uh, the slaves would follow the same general route, at least. Yes. Well, what was the reason for establishing this trail in the first place? Was it on high ground and therefore uh, easily traveled? Yes, they tried to find the, the easiest route for them to go. And of course, they were also looking for good campsites where there'd be fresh water and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say that these old trails are the present highways? In a general way, yes. They follow the same general path, although the highway doesn't stick very close to the trail itself. Well, I thought perhaps the advantages of this high ground and uh, the fact that they would not get into uh, low places and muddy areas. Yes, but with modern machinery, of course, they have been able to take off the hills and fill in the level, the valleys and so on, yeah. to a large extent. Now, as far as the Underground Railroad is concerned, I imagine there would be an advantage in staying off some of the uh, main trails, that is, the stagecoach trails. and Very definitely. And uh, in order to escape detection. Very definitely. That's why the, the trail very seldom take a, the same route any time. It, it might vary 12, 15 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, would you say that the uh, activity on the Underground Railroad began about the time this house was built, around the 1850s, so yes. far as Iowa is concerned? Uh, the uh, activity on the Underground in Iowa uh, began in the eastern part of the state, that is going from north to south, yes. in Muscatine and through there, in Salem, uh, somewhat earlier, of course, did in the west. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular route through Lewis was in the latter part of the 1850s, mm -hmm. from about 1854 and 55 until about 1860. That is, uh, as soon as the Civil War began, I suppose there was no special reason to operate the Underground Railroad anymore. That's right. The, uh, the slaves were being uh, freed by the uh, advancing armies of the North, of course. How do you account for the fact uh, that uh, there were so many ministers involved in this operation of the Underground Railroad? I mentioned the fact that Reverend Hitchcock built this house and built it very largely as a, as a refuge for slaves on the Underground Railroad. In Tabor, Reverend John Todd was one of the leaders in the Underground Railroad. Well, of course, the, among the leaders of the whole underground movement, uh, the anti-slavery movement for that matter, throughout the North, the uh, certain creeds, like the Quakers and the uh, uh, Calvinistic groups, the, Pur the, the uh, Presbyterians and so on, were very staunch in their belief that slavery was wrong. Mm -hmm. and so it was logical that they would take leading part uh, in the helping the slaves escape. Fine. Thank you very much, Dr. Pendergraft. Now, I think we'll have time for a little review here before our visit is over. Let's go over briefly some of the points we've tried to make in connection with our visit here in Lewis. Remember that this house back here, the house built by the Reverend Mr. George B. Hitchcock, was to all outward purposes a parsonage, the home for the minister and his family. And yet, as I've mentioned several times, he was thinking at the same time of the use of this house as a station on the Underground Railroad. This is not the first house that Reverend Hitchcock used. There was a, a, a wooden building near this location, which was his first home, and the slaves soon discovered that here was a friend who would help them on their way. And so many people stopped in this wooden structure 
that Mr. Hitchcock decided he'd have to have a larger house. And the main purpose of the house, really, was to serve as a station. Remember also that according to the terminology of the Underground Railroad, Reverend Hitchcock was a conductor. So this is, this was the home of a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And as Dr. Pendergraft told you, the name of the Underground Railroad came from a remark made by a southern planter who said, it seems that the slaves are escaping to Canada as though they were traveling on a railroad underneath the ground. So perhaps that can serve as the theme for our review cartoon. Let's assume this is the surface of the ground. And here, underground, is a train of the old days. Trains at that time of the 1850s had this funnel type of smokestack, as you remember. And here are the wheels and the back wheel. Now, of course, if this is the top of the, the ground, it would be very difficult for a train actually to go underground. It would take a tremendous system of tunnels, wouldn't it? We know that in the West, many times the railroads tunneled through mountains because it was easier to do that than to go over the top. But an underground railroad, as we use it in American history, did not mean that any part of this escape route was underground. With the exception of tunnels that were sometimes built between stations in the same community. In Salem, for example, there are two houses about two blocks apart, which were actually connected by a tunnel. So that if the sheriff came to one house, the slaves could escape underground through this tunnel to a house about two blocks away. And there is a legend that in Tabor, that was also the case, that a tunnel ran under the commons from Reverend Todd's home to another house on the other side of the town common. That has never really been proved, but there is a legend to that effect. So don't imagine that the Underground Railroad actually went underground. The Underground Railroad was a, a means of escape which was very useful, but the underground feature merely referred to the secrecy with which the conductors operated. So we can get a picture of a conductor here, a conductor of an underground railroad, by just enlarging upon this a little bit. And we'll make a cap out of this, you see. And here is the nose. And here is the determined jaw of an operator of the Underground Railroad. <coughs> a man who was determined to help these unfortunate people escape and who was therefore called a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And he wasn't actually underground. Next week, we are going to Mount Vernon and we'll visit one of the centers of Christian education, one of the early colleges established in the state of Iowa. Until then, goodbye. Today, your teacher has been Herb Haig of Iowa State Teachers College. Landmarks in Iowa History is produced for Iowa TV School Time by WOI-TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. TV School Time is presented daily, Monday through Friday at 1.30 p.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television.